Elizabeth Holmes on this episode of Law Junkie Show. Last week's witnesses took the stand. The defense continued to play very well at this. Is the law more important than the science in this case? And what about that baby? But first, we heard from witnesses last week, medical personnel, lab technicians, and patients who experienced false and erroneous test results. We heard from Victoria Sung, a scientist with Cell Gene Corp, a company specializing in biopharmaceuticals. They looked into partnering with Theranos, but decided to pass after once again, the testing was simply not up to standard. Then there was Dr. Adam Rosendorf, the former lab director at Theranos. There were some tense moments between Dr. Adam Rosendorf and Elizabeth Holmes' attorney, Lance Wade. Wade seemed to be particularly excited about and especially focused on the testimony of Dr. Rosendorf. Wade indicated early on that he planned to spend a lot of time with Dr. Rosendorf on the witness stand. Then John Bostick of the prosecution became concerned and asked if Wade and the defense were going beyond what had already been covered in their questioning as prosecutors. But Wade protested and said, the government offered a broad indictment of the laboratory practices at Theranos and essentially put the responsibility for that at the feet of my client and others. This answer was apparently good enough for the judge, but to me, is there enough legal substance in that response? How does an attorney decide when to appeal to the emotions of the judge or the jury, or in this case, the judge? This isn't a legal argument necessarily. This really is more emotional because in the trial, you have the prosecution's case in chief with this witness accusing the defense's client, the defendant, Elizabeth Holmes, of, as he pointed out, I think correctly, very broad allegations regarding the laboratory. And if that is the case, then as the defense, I have the argument which he made, I just think very correctly, look, you're accusing my client of being responsible for the lab and everything that the lab is doing and that you're making the allegation that the lab committed all kinds of false and bad things and you're attributing all of those directly to my client, Elizabeth Holmes. Therefore, I have the right to pick apart this witness and I'm going to start making the allegations that it's the lab director's responsibility to point out, look, this isn't working. This is what we're doing. I, better yet, I hired the lab director to set the standards to follow industry practices. And if the lab director didn't do that without my knowledge as Elizabeth Holmes, I have the right to pick this apart. The judge has a lot of leeway in the trial to, do, to allow the defense to make these types of threads of questioning to allow the jury to see that my client isn't liable for this. And I think Judge Davila made the right choice here. The defense attorney made the right argument with the judge. And we'll see how it plays out, though, with the jury. Wade seemed delighted to be spending so much time questioning Rosendorf, even saying the exciting stuff comes at the end. Whereas with Sudka Ganga Kedkar, who had the position prior to Rosendorf, she had immunity. How did she get immunity and why didn't Rosendorf get immunity? Well, immunity is at the discretion of the prosecutors, in this case, the U.S. Attorney's Office because this is federal crime, not at a local prosecutor level. Ms. Ganga Kedkar was, I believe, the original lab director. And so her knowledge and her what she did as the original lab director may have potentially been criminal in nature, some of the things that she did. And to get her testimony against Ms. Holmes her attorneys likely negotiated with the with the prosecutors here, the, the U.S. attorneys, 
saying, hey, look, you know, she's happy to cooperate. She wants immunity for anything she may have, you may think she had done. And so that was just a simple negotiation. Mr. Rosendorf coming in after the fact, when the potential crimes maybe had already happened, there likely just wasn't the need for immunity because he's not liable for certain things if it had already been done. So, for example, if I came in, I'm a, let's say I'm a car mechanic and the brakes had already been screwed up on the car and I'm coming in to try and figure out how to fix the brakes on the car, I can't be liable for the person before me who screwed up the car. So Ms. Ganga Kedkar maybe had been, had some liability there. And so her, as a result, her attorneys negotiated that immunity. Mr. Rosendorf simply didn't need to. Rosendorf is saying some things that seem maybe slightly contradictory. And you have to wonder, is it because he doesn't want to entirely incriminate himself? And in so doing, is he somehow benefiting the defense? Or how can the prosecution use what he's saying to their benefit? Well, again, the the key here is for the prosecution to have their witnesses say, Ms. Holmes knew we told her this was bad. This isn't, wasn't working. This couldn't work. So their job is to get their witnesses to say, Ms. Holmes knew everything, yet still proceeded to say something opposite to the investors, to the doctors, to the patients. And so that's where Mr. Rosendorf, that's what they're trying to get from him. And again, the defense is just trying to pick it apart and say, look, you didn't necessarily clearly state that and or you weren't even following industry standard practices and Ms. Holmes didn't know that and so forth. There's an email exchange where Rosendorf is pointing out some of the problems with the proficiency tests and Holmes' response is, this is why we retained the best regulatory counsel in the country. So she's basically saying like, eh, you know, you're not a lawyer, so be quiet. And Sunny Balwani chimes in, quote, is extremely irritated and frustrated with folks with no legal background taking legal positions and interpretations on these matters, end quote. Would their attorneys even want that kind of authority? Wouldn't the attorneys want the input, if not straight up, to defer to the scientists on this? Don't the attorneys have to cross-reference policy with the science and technology at hand? Well, it depends. It depends on what exactly the attorney's role was. It also depends if Theranos was truly doing something that was groundbreaking. So often in the law... The law depends on experts to tell us things like, what is the industry standard practice? If you deviate from the industry standard practice, maybe you have more liability. If you follow industry standard practice, then you basically don't have liability unless you did something negligent or grossly negligent. Those are the terms that will be used in the law, meaning you knew what you were supposed to do, yet you did something otherwise or you behaved in a way that was neglectful of what those standards were gross negligence is you're acting in a really above and beyond in a way that a reasonable person would look at and say no 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 no. i wouldn't do that Um, and you shouldn't according to these industry standard practices so it's really a dance between the experts and the lawyers but the lawyers often will think that they know more uh, especially if they're top regulatory attorneys, they maybe think that they know all of what the standards are because of their experience. And again, that's where this idea of if Theranos is really breaking new ground will shift that. But again, any of these smart attorneys will know that that industry standard or standard practice then is no longer valid. So 
were Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani right to criticize the scientist? Not necessarily. Um, the scientists often will know what those standards are. And they maybe because of their experience, like Mr. Rosendorf, maybe even know what the law is. However, do they know the law in a way that they can practice in court? No. The prosecution is still making their case, but the defense has not taken any opportunity so far to sort of pepper in their abuse defense that they are apparently going to go with, at least in one way. When can we expect to see that come into play? Would that be only if or when Holmes testifies? Are they, is that a card they're waiting to play or? Well, th this is where the, these weird intricacies of how trials work matter that TV shows often don't explain. The prosecution starts, it's called their case in chief, meaning that they lay out their argument. We're in that portion of the trial still where the prosecution is calling their witnesses, presenting their evidence to make the case that the defendant, in this case, Ms. Holmes, has uh, committed these crimes. When they're done with their case in chief, then the defense presents the defense in chief. And what that will constitute will be things like potentially this abuse defense. It will be things like, well, Ms. Holmes just simply believed that they needed more time and more money. But we're not at that point in the trial. So when the defense is asking questions of the prosecution's witnesses, that is called cross-examination of the witnesses. So the defense is not making their case yet, which would involve what are called affirmative defenses. An affirmative defense is, well, Ms. Holmes couldn't have done this because she was abused and her mental state wasn't as such to allow her to have the intent to commit fraud. That's coming soon whenever the prosecution is done. So they wouldn't take any opportunity or would you take any opportunity to kind of drop any of those hints in now so it's not cold when we do get to our turn as the defense? No, and, and that would be inappropriate actually at this point if that's not relevant to the witnesses that they're cross-examining. And the judge potentially would reprimand them if they're dropping hints because that could potentially prejudice the jury during the prosecution's case in chief. It's just the inappropriate time. And they could even face sanctions if they did that. We're four weeks in and no baby, but we know that experts who were privy to documents that the general public didn't have access to and were following the case very closely said before the trial even started that plans were being made for there to be, at a minimum, additional breaks for the baby. Granted, it's slightly abbreviated, uh, the schedule, the daily schedule, so maybe that has addressed it, but still, there's been no baby. Is it possible that the defense began to hear kind of rumblings before the trial began of how poorly that was playing for Elizabeth Holmes and decided to put the baby on hold. Do these kind of conversations take place? Yeah, these conversations definitely take place. Defense attorneys will even hire people who specialize in juries, jury consultants are what they're called. They may be engaged a jury consultant or three and polled them on this exact question and the jury consultants could have provided feedback saying, yes, this won't play well with juries. They could have also listened to the Law Junkie show and heard how some people were responding uh, and or reading comments on the show saying that people really thought this looked poor for poorly for Ms. Holmes to bring the baby to trial. But they're very conscious of these types of issues and everything matters on how it plays on the psychology of the jury and everything they do is to curry 
the favor of the jury to look sympathetically at Elizabeth Holmes and to see that she was just trying really hard to make good in the world and there's no way she intended to commit fraud and potentially the other defense of course will be and she was abused at the hands of Mr. Balwani. We know that the baby would have had to have come up in early talks with Elizabeth Holmes with her legal team because she had to, it was on the calendar, they, they delayed the trial for her to give birth. And, you know, how would a good attorney go about discussing something as delicate as a new baby with a client without it feeling offensive? Well, it was very delicate, obviously, a uh, new mother. And you have to weigh out your experience with your client to understand how to talk to them in a manner that they'll be receptive. Again, this is extremely delicate as an attorney to say, well, Ms. Holmes, or I'm sure they're on a first name basis. Well, Elizabeth, you're not going to want to bring your baby to the trial. I don't think it's quite as hard as it sounds because I believe that Elizabeth Holmes is fully cognizant that she is facing up to, I believe, 20 years in federal prison for these alleged crimes. So as an attorney, you have the conversation with the client saying, look, you know, mazel tov on your new baby. We're so happy for you. We can't wait for you to spend as much time as possible with your child. We want you to have that opportunity for the next 20 years to spend all this time in person with your child. So what our jury consultants have shown, what public sentiment is showing, is that what the Law Junkie Show commenters are saying is that if you bring your baby to court, it may turn this jury against you. So you already have a nanny, you already have other people. I mean, I don't know that she does, but you already have other people who can take care of the baby. It's just a few hours a day. You know what? Best not to bring the baby to court. I would wager a lot of money, which I don't bet, (laughs) that Elizabeth Holmes heard that advice from her attorney and was like, no problem. Whatever it's gonna take for me not to be found guilty, I'm in. In episode 12, you made it clear that it would be a bad idea to bring a camera into the courtroom illegally. What if someone brings a camera in and they are not caught and the footage is streamed online or posted online and is not discovered, the camera is not discovered in the courtroom? What legal entity would be responsible for pursuing that? And what would be the legal ramifications of posting that online? Well, a couple of things there. First off, you're right. The technology is such now. I believe Facebook just announced new Google Glass style glasses. Snapchat has those two uh, with the little camera built in and audio recording devices built in. Almost impossible to know that that individual would be recording. I, I want to say again, very, very clearly, do not do this. I recommend wholly against it. But mo- but if you do it and if you post it online, it's out there. There's no way the court's going to get all the copies off, uh, off the internet. That's impossible. But they may be able to figure out based on, especially if it's video, where you were seated. And then the judge would engage with the bailiffs, which because this is federal court would involve actually the, I believe the U.S. attorney's office. I'm not experienced in this specific area of where if you committed an offense in federal court, how that would be found. But but I believe that that's the U.S. attorney's office that would actually investigate then at that point. And it is possible that they could triangulate where you were seated. I would also wager, I don't know for a fact in this case, but they're record they are recording who is sitting where in the courtroom 
and they might be able to figure out who recorded it. And then the U.S. Attorney's Office could potentially bring you back into the court in front of the judge, Judge Davila, and could hold you in contempt of court. So that would be the bailiffs that bring you back. And you could be facing jail time and a fine. But would it have to be reported? Would, a, would someone have to see it online and report it? And to whom would they report it? And where would it go from there? Well, the, it would be the judge. So it, it still comes back to the judge. I mean, I can't just report that I, I saw something online. It still is up to the judge saying this was contempt. These were my rules. What if the judge doesn't see it? What if it's up for 12 weeks and the judge doesn't see it because he doesn't what? watch? Yeah, that's like anything. News. You know, if nobody sees you speeding on the highway, are you going to get a speeding ticket? No. So if nobody, if no authority figure who is responsible sees that footage online, you got away with it. Do I, again, do I think that's a good idea? No. If someone reports it, then is it more likely to be pursued or would it be ignored? Oh, I don't I don't think it would be ignored. I think the judge in this case made it very clear. There's no audio, there's no video. He is not going to likely not going to just sit idly by if somebody reports it that it's been recorded. And who would someone want to report it to? If I saw it and I was just appalled that someone would record that illegally, who would I call? Other than Ghostbusters, you should call uh <laughs> you would call the courthouse. Uh, to some to get somebody to notify the judge, and I don't know what the re reporting mechanism is for that. Actually, I'd have to look that up. But but you would reach out to the courthouse if if you were the one who observed it and wanted to report it. That's where I would go. I it's not, yeah, it would be at the courthouse because it's really the judge's rule that yeah. you're violating. California is a two party state. You can't do that. You're breaking the law. If you record a conversation without the other party's consent, and in this case, the judge issued a rule that said no audio and no video. So anything that you do is in violation of that rule. And so you're in contempt of court. Again, like all rules and all laws, only if it's pursued, are you then going to be held liable. If a person was pursued and held liable and sought legal counsel, what, what's a good defense for that person, seeing as everyone deserves a fair defense? Well, the defense would be you'd have to find out from your client because the attorney cannot lie to the court. That's Rule 4.1 under the ABA model rules, which California has adopted, and m most states have adopted in, in, in many forms. So... If your client says, I didn't know, you would be pleading to the court. Oh, my client didn't know the difference. Uh, it was a mistake. It was an accident. What, whatever your client said, that would be where I would be going for a defense is it was a mistake. It was in, it was in the public interest. It was some policy argument that the, the public has a right to know what's going on. We don't have access to this. There's a First Amendment argument. You're probably going to lose, but you would make those types of arguments. Keep listening to Law Junkie Show for the latest on the Elizabeth Holmes Theranos trial. And thank you for listening to Law Junkie Show. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. If you want to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, all the better. Follow us on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And visit us at lawjunkieshow.com. You can send us a message there on the contact form or at info at lawjunkieshow.com. We love your questions, comments, and welcome your ideas for upcoming episodes. Disclaimer, the Law Junkie show, including its guests and hosts, are not giving out legal advice, but discussing general legal issues. Law Junkie show does not guarantee that the legal issues discussed are fully accurate, and it's not specific to whatever legal issues you may be experiencing. None of this advice is to be acted upon in your situation. Please seek legal advice from a licensed attorney in your jurisdiction for your individual legal matter.